Hi there, and welcome to One Idea Away. Not just a podcast, but a community and ongoing conversation meant to inspire and empower individuals to live more fully, deeply, and consciously. Let's jump into today's episode right now. I feel like the way that I want to open up today's show is to talk a little bit about the Australian palliative care nurse, Bronnie Ware. You see, she used to take care of patients in their last 12 weeks of life or so, and she wrote a profound blog post on the insights and revelations of the dying. Uh, It became actually quite a a well-known book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying, and it's the number one regret that really just completely stands out to me. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. This is a point in insight for so many reasons, not the least of which are just how many people out there are just not as fulfilled or happy or at peace with their lives, what they do for a living, and even who they are, or at least in terms of how they're showing up in their lives. It makes the topic of authenticity and knowing your true self, your authentic self, all the more important to understand and dig into. And that's what we're going to focus on today with our guest, Ira Israel. Ira is the author of How to Survive Your Childhood Now That You're an Adult. A license, he's a licensed marriage and family therapist, professional clinical counselor. He graduated from the University of Penn and holds advanced degrees in psychology, philosophy, and religious studies. His DVD series, including A Beginner's Guide to Happiness and Mindfulness for Depression, along with his sold-out Esalen workshops, have given him an international following. I got turned on to psychology and philosophy back in college. Afterwards, he worked in the arts, music, cinema, things like that. But it was ultimately a trip in Thailand that really got him interested in Buddhism, meditation, and yoga, which further broadened and deepened the experience that he brings to us today. And with that, Ira, I want to thank you so much for joining us here on One Idea Away. Thank you very much for having me today, Luke. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You know, I, I read the, it's funny because on the one side, I think I want to ask you, you know, how well are you actually surviving, you know, your childhood now that you're an adult? But, <laughs> you know, more, more to the point is I'm just, I'm kind of curious, you get into some really fascinating and interesting concepts of, of how we kind of get conditioned within our early life and by society and how that carries out and how it, it muddies the waters of, of us finding authentic, our, our authenticity. Uh, most people don't spend a whole lot of time looking at all of those perspectives. So I'm, I'm kind of curious what drew you into this field and this kind of reflection and contemplation uh, early on. What, what got you interested in this stuff? Depression. That's what got me <laughs> I had a girlfriend who suffered very, from very, very serious depression. Mm. And so I started researching it. And I wanted to look at it from another perspective, meaning, um, as I write in the book, I don't think that there's a rogue gene for depression that's afflicting 23 million Americans and causing them to take antidepressants every day. Let's take a look at capitalism. Let's take a look at democracy. Let's take a look at our school system. Let's take a look at the myth of romantic love. Let's take a look at all the things that we consider to be normal in our society and just kind of examine to see if they have unwitting ramifications that might be causing uh, stresses, anxiety, Mm -hmm. or depression. So I'm curious why, you know, I, that was the, the kind of the situation that drew you in and, and brought you into this field and to dive deeper. Why do you think it spoke to you specifically? You know, if you look at your, your kind of your authentic self, how did you recognize that, you know what, there's something here for me to go really deep on? So when I graduated the University of Pennsylvania in 1988, um, most of my friends uh, quickly got jobs uh, in Manhattan, and I received a bunch of phone calls from my roommates from from Penn when I was 30, and they were like, hey, I just became a multimillionaire, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to me because... I found them not the happiest people in the world. They were working really hard. They were stressed out. They actually, one of them called me up and said, I can't afford to live in Manhattan on only a million dollars a year, right? And, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, with two kids and the nannies and the private schools and the whatever. And so I was just kind of, you know, thinking about the bill of goods that we were sold by by, by popular culture uh, when we were in our youths, meaning that, you know, when you went to the movies in the 1980s, and you would see these things like if you became rich, you would have a beautiful, sexy wife and you would have two well-adjusted children or not so dysfunctional <laughs> and you'd be happy. Yeah. And all of my friends accomplished these things and they weren't happy. Yeah. So for me, I was, again, I was looking at 
um, what makes happiness. And it turns out that uh, Sonia Dubomirsky does this uh, great bit uh, from The How of Happiness uh, on um, vocations versus uh, mm. jobs. Mm -hmm. So anybody who has a job, if you do anything for money, you're going to be miserable. And, you know, that's what we do in America. We, we're working to make money. Um, and people who know their vocations, voco in Latin means call it. So this is what's interesting to me. And this was what led me into Hinduism, because Dharma, the word Dharma, I stay in the book, is how the universe is operating on the macro level. And then on the micro level, it's your relationship to it. So that includes whether you believe the universe is abundant, whether you believe that God is beneficent. Mm -hmm. All, just why things happen. Why are you the person who you should be? And the interesting thing is that in America, we don't take philosophy classes. But if you go to you know France, where I live, um, people study existentialism. Who am I? What am I doing on planet Earth? And how can I make the best of these 87 years? You know? Yeah. yeah. So. You know, that's interesting because it was uh, information, a, a study that I was just re reading uh, very recently on some of the work that's been done around meaning. And that way back in the 60s, they had started this adult, this uh, freshman study that's been done pretty much every single year yeah. in, in the university, right? In, in college universities. And their top priority, 86% of them had the top priority of figuring out what is kind of my philosophy for life? What am I yeah. going to orient myself towards? In, in the 2000s, it went from 86% to 40% even thinking that was something important for them to look at. Yeah. You know, go figure that we're, we're not totally grasping how do we do this and create this in our later lives. I, I want to get to that, that you know, that and authenticity. I, I, go ahead, go ahead. I, I want to segue into something else because you said yeah. that beautiful quote from the Australian hospice nurse. Yes. What I thought you were going to lead into was, again, from, from the book, I say nobody on his or her deathbed ever said, yeah. I should have spent more time in the office. Yeah. Everybody has the same regret. I should have loved more. Yeah. And so when I'm teaching at Esalen, I'll, I'll joke around and I'll say, okay, how many of you wake up every morning and the first thought in your head is, how can I love more? Mm. Because that's the trick, the happiness. It's not, go, not checking your bank account and seeing, um, you know, uh, yeah. So yeah. it's really, really interesting. You know, it, it, it is a, an interesting way because when we do take a look at these things, I find even with, with some of the work that I've done with clients, certainly conversations I've had on the show, is that when we imagine ourselves, you know, out in the future, hopefully many, 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 many years from now, and we're looking back at our life, and we look at what are the things that we're going to be so happy about and so glad to pass on to generations, and what are the things that we're not going to be so happy about? It's amazing how much perspective that gives us, right? So that we can learn to wake up and ask those questions of how can I love more today? That, yeah. like you said, not normally what we're programmed for. So but before we get into the side of how do we figure out that authenticity and that calling and those types of things, let's start with where we're actually beginning, which is kind of that, that childhood and that conditioned self. And right. so, you know, a handful of things that stood out to me, let's start with this one, was that as children, one of the things that we learned to do is to create almost like a false self, a facade. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that. What, what is that and how, why are we creating those things? So if you look at third world, unsophisticated countries, um, children are in a satchel on their mother's breast uh, for the first five, sleeping with their mother and possibly father for the first five years of their lives. In America, we have a very strict um, and, and abrupt individuation process. So I looked at this psychologically. Jacques Lacan wrote a piece called The Study Miroir, The Mirror Stage. And when you hold a baby up to a mirror, its eyes just dart around for the first couple of months of its life. And the reason is, is because it doesn't have a self. It thinks it's at one with the mother's breast, and it kind of knows instinctually that if you put it down, it, it'll die alone. It, it, it's dependent completely. So between the ages of six months and 18 months old is what's known as the individuation process when the baby gains a sense of self. And again, um, what I'm looking at is, you know, scientists say, you know, we breastfeed for this long. And uh, for my generation, uh, they told our parents that chemical formula was superior to mother's milk. And um, so I'll, my whole thesis is that as sentient beings, what we really want is to be loved unconditionally. And then we gain tools to 
get love that's conditional because we learn how to use a fork because we don't cry that much because we don't run out into the street because we don't do things. But the problem, there's two, there's two problems here. The first one is a lot of that behavior is learned through negative languaging. Yeah. Our parents are don't do this, don't do that, you know, and then uh, subconsciously what they tell us is, oh, we'll love you if you get straight A's. We'll love you if you date this sexual orientation type of person. We'll love you because of this and that. And um, we develop these false selves to try to get our emotional needs met. So in terms of our way of being, uh, there's a wounded child in all of us that's trying to gain the acceptance, love, and approval from our primary caregivers. Even, you know, if we're 60 and they're dead and gone, there's still a wounded child in us that wants to be loved. Like, Dad, aren't you proud of me now? I just made a million dollars. I just did this. I just did that. So I'm, I'm really interested in um, understanding the prejudices, resentments, and expectations that we develop in our childhood in order to try to stave off potential future traumas. Because what I'm saying is that all those things were great because they helped us survive and, and we're here, you know, but those offense mechanisms that we developed are probably hindering us from getting the authentic love that we really crave as adults. So that's what, that's what I'm trying to look at and examine in the book. Yeah, I think that was part of what, what was, you know, an interesting series of connections. And, and part of it was this, you know, relationship to, to our mothers. Part of it was then some of the societal influences that start to come in. But what was interesting to me was how things like those uh, attachment disorders, uh, not disorders, attachment mm-hmm. styles, yeah, yeah. I should say, yeah, yeah. and disorders as well, but attachment styles and those defense mechanisms, how those later manifest Right. How that attracts us to people that reflect certain things back to us, uh, because that mimics what, you know, childhood was was like. And it's amazing to see the ripple effect that that, you know, these situations have. I want to ask. Go ahead. There's a beautiful quote by Harville Hendricks who says that the subconscious purpose of marriage in America is to enable us to complete our childhoods. Mm. Our parents had deficits. Those deficits wounded us. Those wounds became defense mechanisms, and those defense mechanisms became our personalities. And we'll always be attracted to people who can replicate the dynamics from one or more of our primary characters. Givers, and the interesting thing is, I was with Marianne Williamson uh, about six weeks ago, and she said, "And if our loved ones can't replicate those dynamics, we'll train them." Yes. So it, that it's a really interesting thing because you notice, um, hopefully, you know, I'm raising consciousness in the book so that you and I, when our loved ones are showing up for us as our You know, they're triggering our mommy issues, our daddy issues. And, you know, we have to be aware of um, those things that are going on so that we can have the real discussions instead of them devolving into fights about something that transpired 40 years ago. Yeah. So that's interesting because we're we're either looking for the the dynamic that, that existed or we're creating the dynamic that existed in one way or another. And I love that that just kind of perspective of of you know when we do look at our our marriages, our coupling in, in different ways that we're presented something again that gives us a chance to complete the cycle to heal this very you know different way of looking at it than, than most of us do. But all of this to me is predicated, and I know you speak a lot about this in the book, with raising our awareness of what's yeah. really going on. So I, I guess maybe let's let's turn to that page of things sure. of how how do we become aware of what these patterns are before we even know what it is that, that we want to change. Because we've got to be aware of what the issue is before we can change right. what that issue is. How do we heighten our awareness to that degree so that we can catch ourselves ideally on the front end of it, not while we're in the middle of the argument creating the next dynamic? Um, I advocate working as, with a psychotherapist. And what I do as a, as a psychotherapist is try to create a narrative um, very quickly. It might take 15 minutes. It might take a half an hour. You don't need to be in psychoanalysis for five years every day. I, you really just need to look at the, your, your relationships, your, your intimate relationships throughout your life and find patterns. Did, could you have leaned in a little more? Or, or like, um, did you avoid somebody because of this or that? So, you know, there's only four types of uh, attachment dynamics. 33% of people can securely attach, according to most of the theories, and then the rest are insecure. So it, for, for most of us, we um, sadly, uh, you know, and this again, 
And that's why I think people are working so hard, working 80 hours a week, because we are so, uh, our generation is rather avoidant. We've seen, we saw yeah. a lot of dysfunctionality with our parents. We saw them yelling and screaming at each other. We might have seen them hit each other. And in our minds as kids, we were like, man, if that's love, I don't want it. You know, and so we became um, somewhat uh, ambivalent about uh, relationships. And most of us don't have great communication tools to sit there with another person. We get triggered. We freak out. We might say something that's regrettable. And then, you know, we can either make up and start all over again. But, you know, we really need to um, learn how to show up as our highest selves in relationships. And again, that's what I'm, I, I, I want people to gain from reading the book. So if, it, so if it provokes you to sit down with a psychotherapist mm-hmm. and say, you know, I'm really curious about my attachment dynamics. I noticed like my last three girlfriends. They all left me because they said I was aloof. Uh, let's examine that. You know, what, what did I do? Did I not show up for dinner? Did I not return the text messages? Did I do this? Did I do that? How could I have been aloof? Or maybe um, you were smothering in the last couple of relationships. You know, there's just like you just need to understand the way you're showing up for other people. And again, um, there's a great quote by, by Lakana who says, language thinks me. So... Mm. Again, be impeccable with the words that you're choosing when you're when you're conveying what you want to convey to people. I mean, I, I make I I used to make jokes and I used to say, you know, it's really interesting when people say um, I love you because sometimes they they they're saying it only because they need to hear it. Yeah. So I'm about if I'm all about authenticity, I would rather someone say, you know, I'm feeling a little insecure. Could you just tell me uh, like that you love me rather than like th- fish and throw yeah. out that little lure so that I can hear what I need to hear. So yeah. again, yeah. you know, it's about showing up in a, in a certain way and knowing your own needs and being to, able to express them compassionately. I just wanted to take a moment to introduce this week's momentum building exercise. And it builds off of something that Ira just raised a little while ago. He starts talking about what is the trick to happiness And of course, we know that it's not that at the end of our lives, we want to look back and say, wow, we really wish we had worked more. Sure, so much of our lives are about working more or doing more, uh, trying to achieve so much more and constantly being in motion. And yet those are not the things that produce the greatest happiness for us. Instead, it's questions like the one that Ira begins his days with. How can I love more? Just picture that for a moment. How can I love more? And imagine starting your days that way. So this week's activity builds off of that. More love, more life. That's the exercise that we want you to jump into. And it's going to help you understand the different ways that you can show up even more fully with more love to different aspects of your life that are going to create real impact and a ripple effect, momentum across all that you do and all that you are. So I hope you're going to check that out. Just go over to oneideaaway.com forward slash love more. That's oneideaaway.com forward slash love more for this week's momentum building exercise. So there, uh, again, a lot of things in there, a few things that I just want to, I want to reiterate to everybody. Number one is, is being able to look at what those patterns are for yourself. And part of the ways that you begin to uncover those patterns is having some form of uh, reflection or contemplation time, whether that's with a therapist, whether it's with a coach, meditation, which I know, you know, we, we can chat a little in mindfulness, which we can mm-hmm. chat about in a little bit. Uh, one of the things though, that I did want to extract from there is this idea of being able to sit within that discomfort. Because the more that we we ha- recognize those patterns, the more that we have those contemplative or reflective practices, the more that we can sit in the moment of discomfort as opposed to reacting and trying to get away from it and, exactly. and, or trying to change it in, in some regard. Uh, really important. The piece I wanted to build on uh, before we shift to that, that next part of that conversation, uh, you already went there with the idea that language thinks me because it was something else you said in the book that really, really, really popped out at me. You used the statement that language can become a cage. And I was mm-hmm. hoping you could elaborate a little bit more because I think, again, that's a big awareness thing for people because we do hear our words and we think in our words. And so the more that we become aware of our language, we can see the patterns more easily. So talk a little bit about language and how it could be a cage. 
Language is a trap. Language is a cage. Language thinks me. We don't have a self. You know, I ask in the book, what's the relationship between emotions and thoughts? We're living in a paradigm of cognitive behavioral therapy where we believe cognition. We have thoughts like, oh, my life would have been better if my parents didn't get divorced. And then we have emotions. Oh, I'm sad. I, my, I'll, nothing ever worked out for me. I don't understand this or that. I don't blah, blah, blah. And we just go down these, these spirals and we have to, again, this is going right back to what you asked a minute ago, the benefit of meditation and yoga is being able to cultivate non-reactivity, to, to be able to observe the craziness that we all think, the mishigas, the mental chatter, those hamster wheels in our head that do these woulda, coulda, shoulda, didn't. They're posing these hypothetical things. And I ask in the book, if you came home and saw your wife or child uh, sitting on the couch trying to jam a square peg into a round hole, you would stop them. And yet this is what your mind does all day long. Your mind is sitting there on the couch trying to make a better past. When this is that's insanity. You know, you're trying to create things that cannot be changed. You know, it's it, it's gone. So again, when you're able to sit there and meditate and observe your thoughts and you get a taste for the lunacy, the sheer insanity of the hypothetical, non-possible craziness that your mind is theorizing. And again, it, it, I'm, not, um, I'm not being pejorative. Your mind's task is to try to stave yeah. off potential future trauma. But it does this by creating these woulda, coulda, shoulda, didn'ts, these resentments. And the joke in the book from Carrie Fisher, if I'm not mistaken, uh, well, it's described to many people, but you know, resentment mm -hmm. is like poking yourself in the eye and waiting for someone else to go blind. Resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for someone else to get sick. So you're only hurting yourself. You're only causing your own suffering if you don't accept every second of your life. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I love that that statement of, of from an insight standpoint of that our minds are trying to stave off that future traumatic episode or issue that's that's coming up. And I mean, how many people, how many of us, can, you know, out there, we can validate with our our own thoughts the story that goes through our head and what it is that it's trying to either make right, avoid, uh, whatever that is not even happened yet. It's just a forecast of what may happen. And we're allowing that to bring up our anxiety and our worries, right? It's such a beautiful quote by Sharon Salzberg, Salzberg mm -hmm. in her book. So I, I do this exercise in my classes where there's only nine types of thoughts that we can label. Their thoughts are either about the past, present, or future, and they either have a positive, neutral, or mm -hmm. negative quality. So that's nine. So um, the neutral one about the future we call planning. So when you're sitting there meditating, you're like, that's my mind planning. That's right. my mind planning. And so when I'm leading these meditations, I'll ask people to see which is their default. And for whatever reason, my mind is like, I was brought up in this crazy household where it was, every conversation was like a chess game. And so you had to think like five moves ahead because it, there was so much controversy about, you could say the sky's blue and the other person would say, but it's going to rain tomorrow. They would just, everyone just wanted to be right and, and prove that you were stupid in some ways. So my mind works like that. So now I'm 51 years old, I'm meditating and I'll catch myself like, if this person sends this email, I'll respond like this. And, and it's, it, 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 so, but Sharon Salzberg in her book so eloquently says, my mind plans because it makes me feel safe. Mm. And it's interesting, you know, the future is completely uncertain. All we have are, are our expectations about it, but this planning, and then, you know, you're like, oh yeah, I knew that tree was going to fall or I knew that tsunami was going to come because I planned for it. But yeah. you, you didn't, you know, but that, as human beings, we crave certainty and the world is a incredibly uncertain place. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. One of the analogies I've used before in terms of that, that, you know, mental chatter and chaos that can occur is that idea of this, you know, the shaken snow globe and how often when you shake that snow globe, it looks like everything's going all over the place. And especially if you look at it really closely, but as soon as you can get that little bit of distance, that little bit of perspective, that little bit of breath, there's like this really beautiful pattern that starts to emerge. And what right. you even just described with Sharon, right? It's like that in the moment of the, the mind going, well, I need to do this, or I think about this, or I'm going to respond this way. That's all the, the snow going all over the place. But when you step back and say, it's just my mind trying to take care of me, keep me safe. Right. You can see the beauty in what's going on. So I guess, Ira, the, you know, the part that obviously we, I, I want to pivot to is, so how do we begin to do this? How do we really begin to uncover authentically who we really are? 
where do we begin? The first step is understanding how we became inauthentic and why, and also just accepting it, that it, it, you are the way you are. So yeah. you, you don't walk around saying, oh, yeah, I suck at this, and I shouldn't think like this, and this is terrible. It's not like that. Mm-mm. This is who you are, and let's make some tweaks, let's make some hacks to refine the, your way of being in the world. So what I do after I deconstruct, um, uh, as you know, uh, authenticity, is I reconstruct it as yeah. Um, attachment, atonement, attunement, presence, and congruence. So we've already covered attachment, and that's just being aware of your primary attachment style. And the interesting thing is I also feel as if human beings have a theory about reality or perspective or paradigm, and then they go for the rest of their life looking for for facts that rise to meet Mm -hmm. that theory, and they don't see the other ones. So I think that people either believe um, like preternaturally that the world is an abundant place or scarcely scarcity driven. And that that really shapes the way you're showing up in the world. So it's good to know, like, like, do you check your bank account every day or do you check? Are you did you check it once a month or, you know, like just like how you feel about um, safety, security, money. Do you have five locks on the door? Do you have a gun at the bottom of your closet? Like, how do you think the world is and, and your relationship to other people? So that's all included in your attachment dynamic. And then the second part is atonement or at one minute. And that's, um, releasing our resentments about things we can't change as we just discussed. Mm. And that's, you know, um, just the tool is forgiveness. So, um, you know, the joke that Lily Tomlin tells is forgiveness means giving up all hope of having a better past. (laughs) We we can't, we can't change our past. Anytime we're not accepting something we can't change, that is insane. Right. So we have to, instead of, you know, trying to shove that square peg into a round hole, just say, Hey, I I am who I am today because of everything that's taken place in my life. And I have to be thankful for it as opposed to, you know, resisting it. So atonement means it doesn't mean condoning anyone Mm -hmm. else's actions. Mm -hmm. It means leasing your right to resent that, you know, whatever happened, happened. You're just accepting things, forgiving, you know, whoever. The third component is attunement, and that's being able to really connect with other human beings through eye contact and having our, um, our, 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 our facial affect mirror the other person. As I say in the book, mirror neurons do not fire via text message, and one hug equals one million Facebook likes. So we live in this, cra- live in this crazy society where we're deluded into believing that we're connecting with other people when we swipe right or we like their Snapchat thing or we do the instant message or text or something. And it's, it's, it's causing alienation uh, and depression because we need hugs. We need to break bread. We need to throw Frisbees. We need to take walks, have a coffee, drink a beer, throw a football, get our nails done. We need to be with other people and commune. We are social creatures. We are interdependent creatures. We need to just talk about movies and literature and and not about money and not bragging and not about our fabulous vacations and whatever you know we need to really just commune like what like we used to before the internet so that's attunement the fourth part is presence and that's not letting our minds drag us into the past or drag us into the future and the tools in the book that i use are yoga and meditation. That's what they were designed and, and the biased for. So that's presence, being able to be in the present moment. You know, Ram Dass's beautiful quote, be here now. That's it. Super simple. And then the, four, the fifth part is congruent, which is having our outer worlds match our inner world. So we're living in this incredibly privileged, luxurious time in society where we're not running from imminent danger, lions and tigers and dinosaurs and bombed. And we can decide who we want to be and what lives we want to live. And then we can go out and find the tools that'll keep us at the high end of our happiness ranges and in integrity with ourselves. So I start the book, as you know, with that beautiful, beautiful quote by Andre Gide, who said, it is better to be hated for who you are than to be loved for who you are not. So for me, you know, we develop these false selves to try to get love as kids, and we should be happy about them. Whatever, if you we were the sarcastic guy in school, if you were the geek in school, if you were the chess kid, if you were the A straight A's, if you were the rebel, if you were the whoever you were, you know, at that, in your adolescence, just, it's cool, it's fine. I had a fucking mullet, you know, <laughs> like, uh, it, 
<laughs> I, I've had to burn all those photos. I'm, so, I'm sorry for swearing. But anyway, <laughs> but, but still, it's like you just accept that. And now I, I, you know, I don't have to be that rebellious guy. I can be the loving guy. Yeah. I can make a decision about um, how, uh, what tools will keep me at the high end of my happiness range. And having a mullet and bringing a six-pack for breakfast will not keep me at the high end of my happiness range, so I don't need to do those things anymore. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's actually, I just want to run back through this real quick because I, I, I want everybody to capture this. So those first two, attachment and atonement or at one mint, I love the way that you would explain that. Both of these begin with that field of number one is awareness to understand what mm -hmm. it is that's going on. And I like that, that you know, I, I appreciate that you, you use not only the word forgiveness, but use the word release as well, mm -hmm. right? Because this, totally. isn't, this isn't about agreeing with what's happening, happened to you. It's not about condoning whatever it is that you've gone through. It's just simply about releasing that I can't go back and change that past. The past is what it is. And so there's a tremendous amount of awareness and, and acceptance and, and stuff that can come into those first two uh, moments. It's the, the next three that I just wanted to tie together from a, a just a, a proof standpoint, just for, for everybody's awareness. When we talk about attunement, Mm -hmm. you know, and the, and the point about connection relationships, connection is absolutely hands down, empirically proven, the number one thing right now that we know, right? The number yep. one thing that leads to happiness and health right. in, in, in our <laughs> life, okay? Studied for over, almost 80 years now out of Harvard on one of these studies. That's right. It's the one thing almost, they can agree on, okay? Uh, so we know that that's a path to happiness and health. Presence. One of the things on presence that's been proven out with uh, Dan Gilbert and, and Matt Killingsworth is that when we are focused in the moment, when we, we feel like our minds are brought into engagement with whatever it is that we're doing, we feel more fulfilled. Right. Who doesn't want that, right? We feel less fulfilled and we don't feel that life has as much meaning when we're constantly distracted. So right. presence speaks to that. And I think this one around congruence, I, I really appreciate you bringing up. It happens to be one of my, my, my favorite words and, and favorite kind of themes to look at life because I think it's the one that that is can be very liberating and is also one of the ones that we struggle with uh, immensely during our our times, and it is how do we bring ourselves into alignment with right. what it is that we truly believe, that we truly value, that we truly want to bring out in ourselves. And I'll tell you, there's a beautiful quote by Carolyn Mace who says, "You either co-create your life with spirit." Or your wife will cheat on you. You'll get fired. Bad things will happen. Like, and, and that's so, again, vocation is not a passive yeah. thing. You, you know, you have a relationship with the universe reality, and your tastes are your conduit to listen to what your higher self or mystery or God or whatever yeah. you believe in is telling you. Yeah. So, you know, you're, again, I like that the, the languaging is so precise, co-create your life with spirit, you know, mm -hmm. real, and that's why meditation is so delicious because when you're sitting there after a while, the, the, the ego starts to dissolve a little bit and then you can be open to, to you know, hearing, oh, you know, I just received the most amazing thing in the world this morning. So, um, there was a big Google executive who took my class and, um, I do this crazy thing called uh, drive-through therapy at, at Esalen. And I give everyone 10 minutes. And um, it, the woman was having some problems with, you know, as we all do, with uh, showing up for a career for mm -hmm. 30 or 40 years or things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really fascinating. She, she, like, made this total pivot. And she what, had a big high-tech job. And, and she's, like, a train, she went down to halftime. And she's training to be a doula now. And it was just so exquisite that, like, you know, just our one interaction, like, you know, you, you can set someone on a, on a new um, route just by saying, be open to, you know, your own taste. What do you love? What are you passionate about? Are you passionate about art and literature? You know, as I said, we live in this crazy society where everyone is competing to be busy because it, it gives you this false self of, of importance. You know, when people ask me what I do and they're playing that game, like, how much can you, how much do you make? Can you help my career? I, I'll, I'll just look at them and I'll say as little as possible. That's my answer. Because <laughs> I'm highly neurotic. I'm working, uh, you know, intensely. So my goal when someone, you know, when they say, what do you do? I say, well, I do as little as possible, you know, because <laughs> I'm trying to connect with other people, you know, exactly. I'm, not, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, have a, I, I don't, you know, um, I'm not trying to have this, but I, I don't want to, you know, it's in the book. I don't want it to, it won't, but I, I wouldn't want it to say wealthiest guy in the cemetery yeah. on my tombstone. Exactly. You know? 
We all just want to be loved, and we lived in this society which gives us tools to gain admiration. Yeah. Yeah. So what we, no wonder why 23 million Americans go home and take antidepressants. Like, yeah. you have lousy tools. Well, you know, I think when we, we get into this place of both that authenticity and specifically that congruence factor with authenticity, you know, two things open up. One, the story that you just mentioned about this executive that you had worked with, we realize that there are actually more possibilities for us to integrate some of these incredible things in our lives than we realize. And we live in that age of there's there's jobs and careers and paths and openings that can be created or filled that did not exist, were not possibilities however many years ago. And a lot of it's out there once you get turned on to it and you know that it's within you, you start finding these incredible paths. I think the other, which has also always amazed me and, and it, I think it's a beautiful thing, is when somebody gets that clear it all of a sudden is, you know what, my vocation is a matter of what I do in terms of making a living. My vocation is bringing gratitude and appreciation or bringing exactly. happiness, right? So now I can go into work wherever I am, as long as it, you know, is reasonably aligned. You know, it's not, you know, something that's totally against your values or something. And your vocation is what you're bringing in and what it is that you're sharing within that environment. It's not, it's about how you do it, not about what you do in that regard. It's, right? it's so funny. Um, so I teach this sold out workshop at Esalen twice a year and somebody, a lovely person asked me to assist them and they were kind of unaware that I, I was teaching like a, a, a larger course than they were. And I got there and I could tell that they, they had found out and whatnot. And, and there were, I, I could see when the gentleman walked out of the car, like he had this trepidation, like, oh no, like this guy's going to try and throw a, a monkey, an engine, I'm so sorry, a monkey wrench into my mm. engine. He's going to like, he's going to do this and that. And I walked up and I put up my hand and I'm saying, Hey, how are you? I'm here to serve. I'm here to learn. And I got pencils for people. I didn't open yeah. my mouth the whole weekend. And I moved chairs yep. and I got food for people and I just was, I'm here. And, you know, like we all have to be able to drop our egos. And that is real, what the interesting thing about, um, you know, I live in, where, where are you? I'm in Santa Monica. Where are you right now? I'm in New Jersey, just outside of New York. So um, I live in this rarefied community of like yoga celebrities. And I, I would make a joke all the time. I say, how do, you, how do you tell, like, who's a good yoga teacher or not? And people say, how? And I say, they answer your phone calls. Mm -hmm. Because if yoga has worked, that means they've dropped their egos and that they answer their phone calls. Mm -hmm. And if they still think they're a celebrity because they have 50,000 or 80,000 Instagram followers, then they haven't learned the lesson of yoga. Right. They can do, they can do the asanas, but the, the philosophy is, is long gone. <laughs> Yeah. So that's how you tell a good yoga teacher. They answer your phone calls. I appreciate that. So Ira, let's let's bring this around. Uh, one of the things that that is kind of an important part of of this podcast, this community also that it belongs to, is that it's not just the time that we spend here, but it's the conversations that we stoke. It's it's what they do based on the interview that they've just heard. And I guess I'm curious for you, what is it that you hope for everybody that's listening today? What's the conversation that you want them to continue after they listen to this? It's always about making a choice to drop our egos, which are there as defense mecha mechanisms and built for good reasons and choose love. Um, you know, life is very short and I was listening to a podcast yesterday and it was about Heidegger and someone asked him, um, how do I learn how to be authentic? And he answered, spend more time in cemeteries. Mm. So, you know, I'm 51 years old. The vast majority of human beings who walk the planet Earth never reach the age of 40 years old. 3.5 billion people live on less than $1.90 a day. 6,500 children are going to die from diarrhea and other things in the next 24 hours. You know, you can read the paper, and if you don't realize that you are one of the most privileged human beings to ever walk the face of planet Earth, and to walk around saying, oh, I'd be happy if I had this type of car, or if this thing happened on Facebook, or whatever, like, it's just, we're so misguided as a species, and it's just time to wake up. Mm. Well, Ira, I want to thank you for helping us survive our ch childhood uh, and really kind of step much more uh, into a vision of who it is that we truly are and who it is that we can, can really, truly become and, and bring into this world. Thank you so much for being here.
Thank you, Luke. It's been a pl- pleasure. Thank you. You know, for everybody, I, I guess I want to, the first thing I want to do is, is, you know, remind you of what Ivor threw out before, which is that idea of, of how can you begin to wake up and each day ask that question of how can I bring more love to today? How can I bring that more into my life today? It's a wonderful way to begin your day and to, to really let it cascade and see what starts to change for you. And it could be love. It could be happiness. It could be gratitude. Whatever it is that you want to orient your philosophy and your focus on, how is it you can bring more of that into today? Uh, of course, go ahead, check out the book. Uh, it, again, the full name, Ira Israel, How to Survive Your Childhood Now That You're an Adult. It was a really good book. Uh, hopefully, you'll get a couple of laughs in there like I did, certainly, in reading it. Uh, everybody, I want to thank you once again for dropping in on us. And until next time, continue to enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you really enjoyed it, do me a favor, let us know. You can keep the conversation going and send us a message on our Facebook page, which is simply one idea away. Go ahead and tag me in the post or even just direct messages. Also, I would be incredibly grateful if you could share this episode along with someone that you believe could benefit from hearing the ideas and the messages that we got into. That's pretty much why we do this. So you can just go ahead and share it from your app or email it along, whatever works for you. The point is, is to share, to talk, to discuss, and keep the dialogue going because it's in those conversations that ideas can take hold and create profound shifts in perspective. That's what allows us to live life more fully, deeply, and consciously. As always, we would love to see you post a review for the podcast and iTunes or whichever app you're using. And until next time, remember, you're never more than one idea away from a whole new reality. This is Luke Iorio and One Idea Away, signing off.